To fight an aerial war over intercontinental distances, Allied scientists make a technological leap that defies the imagination. The biggest man-made machine ever devised, and it's made out of ice. In 1942, an unexpected guest pays a visit to Prime Minister Winston Churchill at his official residence in the English countryside. He is Lord Louis Mountbatten, Churchill's chief of combined operations. As it happens, Churchill's in the bath, but that doesn't stop Mountbatten. He goes in and he drops into the water of the bath a block of what looks like ice. Churchill's a bit surprised by this, but he notices the ice is not melting. It's a very special kind of ice. It's called picrete. Picrete is essentially ice mixed with wood slurry. The effect the wood slurry has on the ice is it doubles the tensile strength of ice. Picrete is a super ice as strong as concrete. Mountbatten plans to build giant iceberg aircraft carriers out of this new material. Picrete was the invention of a very eccentric uh, English scientist by the name of Geoffrey Pike. He had discovered by trial and error that if you mixed ordinary ice water with, of all things, sawdust, it slowed down the rate at which the ice melted. Uh, the result was a kind of ice concrete. In the cold waters of the Atlantic or the Northern Pacific, a ship made of picrete could remain stationed out to sea for years at a time. Mountbatten wanted a fleet of ice carriers to extend Allied power across the globe. The advantages of a picrete carrier would be that it provides, in essence, a floating airfield, a whole airfield where you can put squadrons of aircraft. Maintenance levels are low, and the stuff is so dense, they are virtually indestructible. But the picrete carrier would not simply be an iceberg which would melt over time. It will be designed to last indefinitely. The design concept was called Habakkuk, or HMS Habakkuk, and this was to be a floating block of ice which was 2,000 feet long and 300 feet wide, constructed out of 40 feet blocks of picrete. The picrete aircraft carrier was essentially a giant refrigerator. It was composed of blocks of ice, but through the middle ran pipes, and through these pipes ran coolant. Several times larger than the Statue of Liberty, Habakkuk would have been the largest floating construction ever built. By comparison, the biggest ship afloat at the time was the luxury liner Queen Mary, which weighed in at 86,000 tons. The Habakkuk would weigh 2 million tons. After Mountbatten's visit, Churchill writes a memo on December 7, 1942. He writes, the advantages of a floating island or islands, even if only used as refueling depots for aircraft, are dazzling. The memo is stamped in red, action this day. But American help is required to undertake this vast construction project. In August 1943, senior Allied commanders meet at the Hotel Frontenac in Canada. Mountbatten plans to sell his vision of using picrete to Admiral King, head of the U.S. Navy. During one session of the Frontenac Conference, Mountbatten brings in two blocks of ice. One is ordinary ice, the other is picrete. Suddenly, Mountbatten takes out his revolver and he fires into the ordinary ice, which just kind of splinters. Everyone is completely confused by what Mountbatten is up to. And he takes his revolver and he fires at the picrete, which is so strong, of course, that the bullet bounces off. In fact, it ricochets into Admiral King and, and nicks his leg. Fortunately, Admiral King is unfazed and impressed by this unorthodox demonstration. The Americans agree to help build a prototype of Habakkuk. Driving down from the Aleutian Islands, a fleet of Habakkuks could launch both fighters and giant B-29 bombers against Japan. Building the Habakkuk and its sister ships would negate the need to capture Japanese-held Pacific Islands for Allied air bases. 
Tens of thousands of allied lives would be saved from jungle fighting. But the ice ships are never launched. The money and resources needed to build them are diverted to other projects. The project was eventually cancelled for a number of reasons. I think the first of which was because the war was at that stage being won by more conventional methods. A lot of conventional aircraft were coming on stream uh, and so the tide was turning against Germany and also against Japan. By the time the prototype of the Pike Creek aircraft carrier was ready, the war had moved on. America was already building the atomic bomb. It had already started to build large numbers of new aircraft carriers. In effect, time had run out for Pycrete. The day of the Maverick inventor was drawing to a close. The need to develop revolutionary new technology took second place to winning the war with less risky methods. America's vast industrial powerhouse was churning out thousands of conventional planes every month and small escort carriers could be mass-produced by the hundreds, giving the Allies the vital platform they needed to dominate the seas. But the ice ships, although never launched, have not been forgotten. Since World War II, there have been numerous proposals to build commercial ships or indeed floating islands made out of pycrete. The latest idea is to build such an island that would house what would be an independent community, free of other governments in the world and uh, free of any kind of taxation. World War II saw the birth of a whole range of radical new technologies. In the frenzy of innovation, not all projects were successful. Some failed through lack of support or resources, some because of technical limitations, and some were simply too far ahead of their time. Many of these secret Allied aircraft projects didn't make it into combat, but that's not the point. They were the products of great minds willing to think outside the obvious, and that's what creates the spirit of progress. These are individuals that are facing real-world crises and challenges. When you understand what they were trying to do, sometimes these design choices, as flawed or as odd or as weird as they may be, uh, start to make a lot better sense. And it is very surprising sometimes when you see how these return in very dramatic form many years later in much more successful fashion.